Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Cynthia Smith. I'm the curator of socially responsible design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. My pronouns are she, her, and to give a brief visual description of myself, I'm a white woman with curly silver hair. I wear round eyeglasses and I'm standing at a podium in the museum's former process lab, originally Andrew Carnegie's library. So you'll notice, those of you in the audience here uh, in New York, you'll notice all of the inscriptions around the perimeter up above. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Designing Gender Inclusive Spaces, which is held in conjunction with our current exhibition that I organized with my colleague Caroline O'Connell, Designing Peace. If you haven't had a chance to view it, please come back before it closes on August 6th this summer. And I wanna thank our supporters who made this program possible, including the Ford Foundation, Lisa Roberts and David Seltzer, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, Helen and Edward Hintz, and the Barbara and Morton Mandel Design Gallery Endowment Fund. In addition to our in-person audience, we're also thrilled to welcome our virtual audience. This program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week, so you can share it with friends who might have missed it. Today's program will run for an hour and 15 minutes. We'll first have our speakers give pre, uh, brief presentations on their work with accompanying visuals. Uh, Lori Brown, distinguished professor at Syracuse University School of Architecture, will speak on safe access to abortion clinics. Seb Chow, associate director at JSA Mixed Design, will discuss the equitable design of public restrooms. And Chilina Odbert, founding principal and chief executive officer of Kukue Design Initiative, our 2022 National Design Award winner, will share about gender inclusive urban planning. After the presentations, we'll have a panel discussion considering the role design can play in creating safe and inclusive public spaces. We'll then open it up to Q&A with you, our audience. For those listening via our live stream, you can share your questions in the chat box and we'll read the questions on your behalf. Please include your full name and where you are, whether it's Brooklyn, New York, London, or Mumbai. It's now my pleasure to invite our first speaker up to share, Lori Brown. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And it's an, ooh, sorry. It's an honor to be here and to be uh, included in this really, I think, important conversation. And when we were preparing for this event, there was something Cynthia said that's really resonated with me, which was that creative confrontation, within creative confrontation, peace is always about conflict. And I really have been thinking about that ever since our conversation, because what I'm talking about around reproductive health care access, I find it hard to find the peace part um, sometimes when we're thinking about this. So it's a, it, was a, it's a, it was a statement that really um, continues to, to make me think. So I've been asked to also introduce myself. So I'm an architect, an academic, and an activist. And I operate at the intersection of theory and practice, which informs my feminist methodologies. I locate my work within what scholar Sandy Grande has termed the feminist political project, one that is not solely interested in academic feminism, but engages broader frames of the historical materialist intersecting with race, capitalism, labor, and economic power. So I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about some of the work I've been doing for over a decade, which uh, at first came out in a book, Contested Spaces, Abortion Clinics, Women's Shelters, and Hospitals. And I wanna start with a very short clip outside of a clinic in Louisville, Kentucky from 2012. And I wanna mention that now in Kentucky, abortion is banned. Basically over 90% of women that exterminate their children are doing it out of convenience. 
Please today repent and turn to Christ. It's so important. Again, as I said, we're going to get all these perverts stuff. We clarify again. Mothers, come out of the woodwork. So that, so what you're seeing, which happened regularly in front of this clinic, was a, over a block long, lined with protesters, where patients would have to park um, beyond that block and would be escorted with the people in the orange vest, those are the legitimate escorts of the clinic, um, and be accosted by people uh, protesting, and then the person in the lime green vest is a part of the protesters. So what interested me initially in this research or in this area was the right to, to, of our First Amendment to protest, but how this right is on the ground understood and lived by those who are engaging in some of these contested zones. And part of this research also includes trying to make visual and visible some of what is really um, invisible within, within this uh, area. So for example, at the time of publication, um, and I'll be updating this this summer, it, what you're looking at is a map that shows the number of providers per state, as well as the gray areas or where the clinics are located. So metropolitan areas of 50,000 people or more is where the clinics are located. As well, I had the good fortune and honor to meet and interview independent providers across the country. So this is the clinic, was the clinic in Jackson, Mississippi, that the Dobbs uh, decision, uh, they brought the, the, the case to the Supreme Court, um, wanting to understand how they were negotiating these things on the ground. And then also looking at things like poverty. The Guttmacher Institute, who collects this, uh, this data, show, has shown that poor women of color are seeking abortions at a higher rate for a number of uh, infra infrastructural uh, problems and challenges. Uh, so the darker the circles, the higher rates of poverty. And then the big circles are female head of uh, households with children under five. So these rates are, are quite high, sometimes in the 70 and 90 percentile of that area. And additionally, looking at what are the states doing that make restrictions harder or possibly in, um, enabling more access. So what is mostly textual, making a visual icon of these restrictions um, so that it becomes a bit more understood what they mean. So you know, some states require only phys physicians to provide um, care. Some states would not allow public money um, or public buildings to be used uh, for abortion. So then additionally thinking about how could we creatively think about space and access. So for an example, back to Mississippi, this uh, myself and research assistants called all the pharmacies in the most restrictive states. So in the state of Mississippi at the time, there were 462 pharmacists. We wanted to know if they stocked and sold emergency contraception because if you could access this, you actually may not need to go to a clinic. And you see that geographically it completely changes where access could be. And we kept track of their comments and the information. And what we found, which was startling, was that 66% of the male pharmacists and 55% of the female pharmacists would not stock or sell emergency contraception. So we also kept track of some of their comments. So we were told um, no one would stock it today. You would have to come back tomorrow. Um, uh, you don't need a prescription, and at the time we were doing this research, you did need a prescription. So it was illuminating in terms of how uh, erroneous information was being passed along, and how this was also another form of, of a challenge for uh, people to access care. Another aspect that I'm really interested in is how law and um, court cases intersect with space and spatial relationships. So I'll give you one example. So there was a Supreme Court case, Hill versus Colorado, but it began in Colorado in 1986 at, because there were so many protesters trying to enter into the clinic and were, and were unable. So the city council created what was called a buffer zone ordinance, and what that stipulated was in 100 feet, so you see the pink um, dot dash box around the building, within 100 feet of that, protesters could not go beyond, and then an eight-foot bubble around someone's body as they're moving in and out of that zone would um, prevent someone, a protester, from approaching the person unless that patient agreed to be spoken to. This made its way all the way through the Colorado Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld it, but then it went to the, the 
the United States Supreme Court, and they upheld it and said, yes, um, there needs to be a way that we ensure that people can access uh, abortion. It was federally a law, uh, guaranteed at that point. Um, so it was interesting to see how literal dimensions around bodies and buildings are became legal precedent, which directly impacts the way we think as architects and designers. So this research has led to a number of ways to take action out in the world that was never anticipated. One being, um, I had met a lawyer who had said, you know, that there are these building codes that are changing from medical facilities. So something like your primary care office, which is what would be uh, needed for uh, clinics, and states were changing them to ambulatory surgical center requirements, which are much more stringent, incredibly expensive to make changes to. And what reads is very banal on paper, so changing a door width by six inches, or a hallway by eight inches, or ceiling heights expanding, or having to create more sinks or more robust HVAC systems was closing clinics left and right. So I created with, some, with, uh, with other research assistants a series of very banal diagrams that you're seeing here to help lawyers be able to argue in front of the courts why these changes were not improving health or safety but really used as political um, agents to close clinics. And this led to meeting the owner and director of the then clinic in Huntsville, Alabama. Now it's, uh, it's illegal in Alabama, abortions are not allowed. But they, at the time, were interested in creating a public interface around their property. And so myself and, a, and Trish Kafferke, who was a former student of mine, we worked together to create a proposal and to let the, and to really respond to the conditions of the property. So to move the entrance, give them more parking, so it displaces the protesters. This wall would meander around the property as, and it would be responding materially and spatially to the conditions on the ground. So where there were protesters, it would be tall, as tall as permitted, eight feet, and solid. And then where it was less needed, in the back in the wooded zone, it would be shorter and more open. And the owner um, was really interested. There was a clinic also in Montgomery who had been using sprinklers quite creatively to water grass, as well as maybe protesters if they were right beside the grass. And he's like, can we use the sprinklers? So I was like, yes, of course, we could figure out a way to do that. So we incorporated the sprinkler system that would be um, activated as needed on the protest side. And then on the interior, we wanted to reveal that as the sculptural moment that would also allow a kind of lush interior landscape to grow and create a much kind of soothing space as patients come in and get out of their cars to go to the clinic. So here's an image of what that may look like on the protest side. And then also when speaking with the escorts, they needed a shaded area because according to, to Alabama law, you, were, you could not allow anyone but the patients to go in for care. So they needed some shaded area. And they also asked for a play space for children because children would come with their, with their mothers but couldn't go in and they would have to wait in their car for hours. So we created a, a water feature area for children to play and this shaded zone. So I want to wrap up and talk about now in our post-row world. And when this went down uh, June last year, um, I could not just sit back and although, you know, I know architecture can't solve everything, but we can participate. So myself and another architect in Phoenix, Jordan Kravitz, decided we were going to create an architect database. And we wanted to, we sent out on social media, if anyone, any architects would like their name to be included, if you work in states where abortion is now legal, let us know. And so we received, uh, to date, about 200 names, including some in building trades. It represents 35 states in the District of Columbia. And we are also creating, have created a survey that we're sending to the states that have deemed themselves havens. So we've sent the survey to New Mexico, and we're in the process of collecting names for Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, um, at, at this point in time. Eventually it will expand, but we want a more robust list for these states so that we can connect. And we've already been connecting providers with architects. And I want to leave you with an image of what abortion access looks like today in May 2023. As you know, it's very fluid. It's, it's changing based on politics. So this is what it looks like now, but I'm sure it will not remain like this in the future. And in, con in concluding, to go back to our creative confrontation, 
I want to just underscore that this, the onslaught against reproductive health care and other civil rights, as you know, is continuing and escalating. And that means that there is an even greater need for, for creative, uh, creative ways to counter these confrontations. And that in order for change to happen, we as designers and architects must be more engaged in how we think about these confrontations to create a peaceful space moving forward. So thank you. I'm Seb Cha, I use they, them pronouns. I'm a tall, Korean, American, non-binary person with like shoulder length, bleach blonde, and black hair, wearing kind of like a goth corduroy black skirt and a short sleeve, kind of like primary color paint slashed, uh, yeah, top. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so in an effort to move beyond land acknowledgments, I'll be donating 20% of my speaker's fee to the Red Nation to promote decolonial efforts, including the rematriation of stolen territory and reparations for the genocide and displacement of indigenous people. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the introduction of our firm's inclusive design principles, which considers an approach to accessibility beyond code compliance and adopts an intersectional approach considering the need of a broad spectrum of the population, including age, body type, disability, gender, race, and religion. But if you're interested, we have many lectures online and content on our website that describes this. So I'm going to jump into why we were invited to join the Designing Peace exhibition, which is on display right now. Uh, we were invited because of our stalled research initi initiative, uh, which since 2015 has created open source prototypes and design principles for inclusive multi-user restrooms, as well as conducting advocacy through lectures, workshops, writings, and legal initiatives. Um, before getting into how we adopted this initiative for the exhibition, a bit of our origin story. So in 2016, President Obama passed a federal law mandating that schools allow students to use the restroom or locker room accordant with their gender identity. In response, there was a backlash. North Carolina, followed by 12 Republican-led states, issued bills mandating that restrooms be used according to the sex designated on a person's birth certificate rather than their gender identity. And just last Wednesday, on May 17th, 2023, Republican Governor DeSantis signed a Florida bathroom bill targeting trans people, which goes into effect July 1st, effectively making it a criminal act uh, to use a restroom accordant with one's gender identity. So in this context, we began to conduct research, realizing quickly that restroom controversies are not new, and that this space has continually registered social anxieties triggered by the threat of marginalized groups entering into mainstream society. This has included women, black people, gay men, and disabled people. The current bathroom wars are just the latest episode in this saga. Trans, non-binary, and intersex, and gender non-conforming people demonstrate that there are many ways of expressing gender independent from biological sex, and this realization liberated us to reject the inevitability of restrooms having to sort people into two categories, men and women. This allowed us to develop the first stalled multi-user prototype, which treated the restroom as a single open space with floor-to-ceiling partitions and communal areas for washing and grooming. Soon after, we began to develop these prototypes with collaborators in public health, whose clinical research and data demonstrated that inequitable bathroom access directly impacts the physical and mental health of not only trans and non-binary people, but a slew of other user groups as well. We began to conduct engagement activities like literature reviews, surveys, interviews, and co-design workshops, which revealed an expanded list of dozens of restroom users with intersecting identities that we wanted to consider. Muslims who perform pre-prayer washings, people who uh, inject insulin and hormones, people who clean their colostomy bags and feeding tubes, and dozens more. We also realized that innovative design solutions were not enough. Making our prototype viable meant amending the International Plumbing Code, which mandates so-called separate facilities for the two sexes. So in response, we joined forces with the American Institute of Architects and National Center for Trans Equality, successfully amending the 2021 version of the code, making all gender multi-user restroom designs code compliant in 35 states. Since then, our office has been lucky to work with progressive clients like Gallaudet University, a school for deaf folks in DC, the SoCal Club in LA, and Carnegie Mellon to implement built inclusive restrooms, some of which are shown here with more in the works. 
Um, I'm going to briefly play this clip from the Ariel series um, just to show that it's been gratifying to see many years of work and advocacy come to fruition and see the positive response to these designs, including this student who's deaf and trans, enjoying our restrooms at Gallaudet University and sharing a video of uh, what they appreciate about the design. Uh, so if you have time, I recommend you check out the Ariel series. So now getting to our work for Cooper Hewitt. So rather than present what we had already done, uh, we worked with Cynthia to think about applying stalled principles to Cooper Hewitt's own ground floor restrooms, which you might use today as a speculative case study, thinking about the specific needs of this building's users and the potentially exciting relationships to adjacent programs on that ground floor, including the lecture room and the design studio. We conducted a workshop with 23 members of the Cooper Hewitt team across departments to understand the specific needs of visitors and staff in this building. The result is an installation which you can find upstairs. Big shout out to the project team, some of whom are pictured here, Joel, Marco, Matthew, Lee, Ben, and Martin. Our installation is meant to evoke the design elements of the restroom itself using mirrors, white countertops at the same height as a sink, penny tile, etc. The front features a highly detailed scale model of our reimagined restrooms that demonstrate our impact at the scale of the building, and this is supplemented by vignette renderings that show our impact at the scale of the body. The back of the installation features a historical timeline that goes deeper into those restroom controversies that I shared previously, as well as a video monitor that describes our stalled initiative. So with my remaining time, I'll walk you through these reimagined Cooper Hewitt restrooms, which we invite you to explore at your own pace um, upstairs in the exhibition if you have time, and also feel free to use the restrooms downstairs and, and think about that before and after. Um, so we reimagined the ground floor restrooms, uh, thinking of this as a so-called wellness hub, addressing the needs of diverse visitors and staff. It's divided into different overlapping zones, welcome, wet, and lounge that generate dynamic relationships with the restroom's adjacent spaces, the design studio, and the lecture room. The welcome zone offers information about exhibitions and events displayed on a digital screen that also plays soothing audio, masking bathroom noises to provide acoustic privacy. Visitors can also refill water bottles or drink from multi-height water fountains. In the wet zone also, you have a multi-height station allowing adults, children, and wheelchair users to groom and wash their hands together. Touch-free faucets and hand dryers are hygienic and easier to use for some disabled people. This facility also includes toilet stalls of three different sizes, standard, ADA compliant, as well as a caregiving stall, which we sometimes also call a comfort room, which includes a sink, mirror, and toilet so that those who need to can wash and groom in complete privacy. And all toilet stalls feature full height privacy doors and partitions. This also includes a nursing room that has a baby changing station, sink, mini fridge for storing formula or milk, as well as comfortable seating, and an interfaith space featuring neutral sacred aesthetics like filtered light, acoustic privacy, and rounded walls, as well as storage containing equipment for people of different faiths to practice a sink and foot shower for Muslims. Finally, the lounge has flexible multi-height seating that accommodates people of different sizes and abilities, as well as an escape space, which is sometimes also called a sensory room, a semi-enclosed room lined with soft tactile acoustic wall panels and diffuse lighting, providing a non-reverberant glare-free interior that can be a quiet refuge for everyone, especially for autistic and neurodivergent individuals who are prone to sensory overstimulation in public spaces. So, this is usually the part where we conclude by saying that an inclusive design approach allows designers and clients to take accountability for past harms and promises formal innovations that can enhance everyone's experience of public space. However, since I've been given this platform, I have a few closing remarks to get off my chest. This is likely informed by the latest bill in Florida. I want to say that I'm so um, tired of talking about this. Um, I've been working to promote the creation and defense of gender inclusive spaces in a professional context for almost six years, primarily with our office, but also as a community organizer and youth educator. I've had to repeat myself hundreds of times, including in lectures, panels, books, and projects, and probably will have to keep repeating myself. And I don't mean to seem ungrateful. I'm lucky to have a career where I can pay attention to issues that I'm passionate about. 
but I wish that I didn't have to. When will gender inclusive spaces no longer have to be a special panel and we can just move on with our lives? When will I stop being asked about the times that I've been kicked out of a restroom, locker room, or the everyday anxiety of using the toilet, all of this trauma porn? Sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in a nightmare where everyone already knows the answers to the questions being asked. So why do we continue to ask? Perhaps it's because the liberals, the progressives, the left are in denial that so many people want to eradicate and erase trans people who prefer to see us dead or disappeared. So we attend, host, or participate in another diversity and inclusion panel, present yet another clever technocratic solution, and pat each other on the backs that we're solving the problem. I also feel conflicted as a queer, non-binary person of color to be the spokesperson for this content. The more I declare myself as these identifiers, the more it feels artificial. For whom am I identifying myself? I know in theory that it's important for people with lived experience to be at the forefront, nothing about us without us, right? But why does it feel so convenient to righteously yell into the echo chamber? We smile and share renderings of a more tolerant world to sell a product that shouldn't need advertising. However, what keeps me going and what gives me hope is my work outside of the discipline alongside my queer and trans community, where these things don't need to be explained. Whether it's working as a camp counselor at a trans camp in New Hampshire and making a friendship bracelet with a seven-year-old while also healing my inner child, or hosting karaoke for genderqueer youth in South Carolina, where vocal effects can trigger euphoria for a shy, questioning young person. A queer artist collective in Hawaii hosting a nude figure drawing night in a tattoo shop after hours where we create our own sanctuary to celebrate each other. But architecture too, while slow, also gives me hope. Our inclusive restroom that opened at Gallaudet, making a trans student stay just a little bit better. Or the head of facilities for a well-known university campus that years ago shooed me away, but is now calling us up to ask for help with inclusive restrooms. And not out of the goodness of his heart, but because we're becoming impossible to silence. Queer and trans people with the support of our allies will continue to defy marginalization. So on that more optimistic note, I'll pass it off to Chalina. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Seb. And thanks for um, those last remarks, most of all. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm Shalina Odbert. I she, her pronouns. I am a five foot five woman with curly, frizzy hair uh, given today's humidity. And I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. I first want to thank Cynthia, Vaso, Alexa, and the rest of the team for the invitation to join this very important conversation, uh, as you can see tonight. We at KDI are a nonprofit design and community development firm working to build a more just and inclusive in all the ways that Seb just described, public realm. We are landscape architects, urban planners, and community organizers working across four offices around the world, in the US, in Kenya, and in Stockholm. And before I get into a couple of projects, I'd like to take just a few minutes to try to draw the connection between gender equity and peace, and how that nexus intersects with our work. Simone de Beauvoir sums it up pretty simply with this quote, but data also affirms this idea as we see here with the statistic. In essence, having more gender equal societies results in more stable and peaceful states. So then the question is, what does it really mean to create a gender equitable world? Well, it means working to change the, <clears throat> excuse me, outdated institutional policies, the discriminatory laws and regulations like those we've seen in the previous two presentations to close this gap between men and women and gender minorities. These are gaps that we see in gender roles, gaps that we have in financial inclusion, gaps in educational attainment, gaps in civic and private sector leadership, and that's to just name a few. Okay, so then one might ask, well, what does design and planning have to do with any of these things? Well, to start, our disciplines have historically helped reinforce these unequal gender roles and responsibilities. And you can look no further than who has been in and who has led these professions from the beginning of time. It has been this with very little of this. 
And that's not just been in these early creative stages, but it's continued through the design process into construction and even, most harmfully, into the usage of the spaces that have been designed themselves. This inequity at the top has then had adverse consequences on mobility, on access to key amenities like public spaces, and safety, particularly for women, girls, and sexual and gender minorities in cities all around the world. So as urban planners and designers today who want to live in a world of sustainable peace, it is our responsibility to promote gender equity in all of our work because our work quite literally shapes the very environment that we spend our days in. I'd like to quickly give you an overview of what we think gender inclusive planning is, but also more importantly, what it isn't. And I won't go through everything you see here on the slide here, that you see on the slide, but just to say broadly that gender inclusive planning and design is more than just talking to women. Um, it is universal. It's not just about building knowledge, but it's about building power. And it's not just about doing a singular project or making a singular adjustment, but it's about committing the needed finances and expertise to follow through on the lofty goals that we often talk about in rooms like these. What it isn't is an add-on. It's not something that should be apart from the regular goals and objectives of a project. Um, and it shouldn't be uninvested. It shouldn't be assumed that this extra work of making something gender inclusive is something that happens um, as an altruistic effort of, of a project team. I'd like to share two projects where we try uh, to focus on this work of making the built environment more gender equitable, and by way of that work, try to make our contribution to building a more sustainable peace. The first project um, started as a project in La Favorita, which is a low-income settlement in Mendoza, Argentina. And this project, as this community, as you can see, um, is not far away in distance from the center of the city, but it is um, miles away in terms of its access to amenities, the access to infrastructure, and so on. This community uh, in particular had, has a park called Plaza Aliar, and this plaza had been invested in in a first round of um, upgrading that was done by the ministry, and that plaza, though it had been invested in years earlier, was a place that was rarely used. Uh, not just rarely used by women, uh, but rarely used by people of all genders. However, those that, you, those that found any use for all, at all for it were men who used the soccer field, who used um, some of the benches for gambling and things like that, which made it even less of a place that women and other genders felt like they belonged. When we talk to women through a participatory process about what it was that made the plaza so uninviting, unwelcoming, and really a place that, was, that they would spend extra time to avoid rather than even pass through, there were many reasons. One of them are simple things like the pathways that you see here. Uh, women in this community, as they tend to be by the numbers around the world, are the primary caregivers and families. And caregiving often requires uh, helping to move others through a particular space, whether that's a stroller, a wheelchair, or just helping someone who has trouble walking. Pathways like this make that virtually impossible. And so when we look at simple things like a pathway, we think, well, this, is, this must have been unintentional and it must be something that's easily fixed. But when you look deeper into how the decision was made, who made the decision, 
who was leading the design, you begin to see this taxonomy of exclusion that, that comes up in pathways but comes up in so many other elements of our built environment. And just as one example, you see here that this simple pathway excludes not just women but many others. And those that do the excluding are all of the people that had a hand in bringing this space to be. And the reasons behind it aren't simple oversight in most cases. They are all of these isms that come along with the way that um, those making decisions uh, are able to exist in the world. So in this case, um, women took to the street to first audit the space, audit all users of the space of all genders, and then they got to reimagining it talking to people about their designs, talking to people about the interventions that they wanted to see. They eventually worked with students of mine at the time at a Harvard Design School to come up with six different ideas that addressed those needs. And in doing that, they came to create this space that you see here. What this space does that the other didn't was simple things like restripe a, a sports field, uh, to change vantage points, to create spaces that move through a space so, and brought you to the center intentionally rather than make you feel alone and isolated in the center of a very big space. It also gave uses like this weekly market that allowed women socially and culturally to have a reason to be in this space, which uh, in time could help to begin to change the way that gender roles and gender norms are uh, understood in this community. Oftentimes when you get to a place project story and you say, well, one day we hope this will happen. What was wonderful about this project is that uh, the ministry and the World Bank supporting this project um, helped it come to be, and this is an early and grainy Google Earth shot of the construction of that site that the community voted on among the six. What's exciting about this project is that it opened the door to a much larger conversation and platform for gender inclusive planning and design. The World Bank asked us at the end of this project to consider taking the process we had developed and the guidelines that we had worked on and try to make a handbook that would work around the world, big task, pretty impossible, um, to talk about the ways in which planning, all different elements of planning, housing, parks, et cetera, could be thought of in a gender inclusive way. And this handbook has guidelines, it has background, it builds the case for why gender inclusive planning is just part of planning period. Um, and that's something that has been very important. I'll close with a project that um, that is closer to home, it's in Los Angeles, and it's also an ongoing uh, body of work that started by assessing the disparity across gender in transit. And in, in a first study, we took a year, this first study called Changing Lanes, we took a year to understand the way that different genders use transit and how transit is not meeting the, those needs of women and other genders. The findings there, not wanting to leave that as a plan on the shelf, we then uh, worked to uh, access philanthropic funding that would allow us to continue this work into a second phase project, which was an action plan to help DOT understand how they could take these findings and do something about them. That project will be complete at the end of this year and will reveal 40 or more um, actions and recommendations across all of DOT's uh, business lines, meaning across policy recommendations, across changes to service provisions, across changes to infrastructure, et cetera, um, in order to make the transit system more gender equitable. All of this work, as with all of our work, was done through a community 
design and policy making process that inverts what is typically done in our professions of bringing uh, women people of all genders into a process and giving real decision-making power to them. These are some of the themes that that eventual plan will cover and will make recommendations within. And as part of that project, one of the steps was to not just leave those ideas on the page as, as a list of things to do for the Department of Transportation, but to try to uh, take one or two of them and put them on the street, put them out into the hands of users so that they could give direct feedback on the way that these types of changes might impact them. We asked our, we have a resident group and a multi-agency uh, advisory group work that is that contains all of the agencies that touch transportation systems in Los Angeles. And we asked them to tell us which of the many things that could be actions that could be piloted should be piloted. And both the community group had a, had a preference and a priority for additional shade and lighting to address this issue of comfort and safety for women and other genders moving on transit. And interestingly, the agency working group also saw that same need for additional shade and lighting. And so that led us to begin to understand the existing systems and regulations and think about prototypes that could work in all of the places where um, traditional bus shelters and trees don't currently work. And in Los Angeles, that's over 75% of bus stops. So we began to prototype a suite of different um, space saving and, and highly effective uh, shade and light giving devices that could meet the needs of the two to four travelers waiting at a dash stop at any given time. These restrictions led us to start our prototyping uh, at, the, at the most restrictive space, ex working only within the jurisdiction of LADOT, which meant a prototype that, without going into all the details, could only touch the pole uh, on which the LADOT dash sign existed. And through that prototype, we um, designed it to be put on the street and tested for four months. And that is, here is a couple of images here of that uh, first prototype that has been now about a week and a half um, being tested by users. This is just one of many shade projects and prototypes that we've done in different areas and at different scales, depending on the restrictions. This is in a rural uh, farm worker community in the Eastern Coachella Valley, again, led by a group of women advocating for safety and comfort on transit. And here are some of the images of that prototype um, in sight. Thank you. Thank you for giving us a glimpse into your work, and um, I'm glad we have time now to unpack some of what you shared. Put my phone back here. Um, so as we begin the discussion, I invite the audience, both here in the museum and online, to begin to formulate your questions, because you'll have time toward the end of uh, the conversation to ask them. And for Seb, Jelena, and Lori, please feel free to ask each other questions, um, as I think this is a good conversation uh, to have. Um, the works that are presented in uh, Designing Peace are intended to inspire dialogue, um, and so here we are, uh, and to actually provoke questions, which uh, all three of you um, provide for us, about what might be possible if we were to design for peace, um, if we were to envision and design a world accepting of multiple voices, cultures, identities, abilities, uh, to design more inclusive and equitable spaces. Uh, the museum, and I think this is an important point, uh, when I give tours of the exhibition, I always uh, talk about this, offers space for exploration, uh, appreciation, 
and respect uh, for various perspectives in the hopes that empathy can begin to build and grow. Uh, and that's what I hope uh, we'll uh, be able to do tonight. So one of my questions is about uh, this idea of durable and lasting peace, uh, not just a fleeting kind of um, um, type of peace. Um, establishing and maintaining safe safe, healthy, diverse, equitable environments, especially our public spaces, uh, which all three of you touched on, is fundamental uh, in creating a durable and lasting peace. Um, and each one of you are creating, uh, really uh, contributing these potent voices to the role design can play in provoking change. Um, so my first question goes to Seb. Um, Stahl takes an intersectional approach to the design of restrooms, um, considering not just transgender and non-binary uh, people, uh, but also considers people of different ages, genders, sexualities, races, cultures, religions, abilities. Um, those are all people who encounter barriers uh, to access uh, in public restrooms and other locations. Um, can you tell us more about uh, the intersectionality of the stalled work and why it's important? Sure, yeah. Um, and yeah, big shout out to Susan Stryker, you know, leading trans historian and activist who is one of the founding members of Stalled, who I think really pushed us to think about how reimagining restroom design could address, you know, so many people that aren't served by this typology and not thinking about it as a space that just sorts people through gender, but is really just a place where we go to relieve ourselves, take care of our bodies and each other. So I think that immediately opened up the conversation beyond just gender. Um, you know, this movement, universal design, which since the 90s has, and the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act has brought people with physical and sensory disabilities more into the conversation, but I think we noticed, especially when we would present this work, you know, six years ago, that there would be, you know, Muslim folks in the audience, Orthodox Jews in the audience, you know, people in the audience constantly telling us, but what about this, what about this? And we realized, you know, just how large that list was. So I think by collaborating with people in public health that had, you know, much stronger methodologies for figuring out the, the massive matrix of all these different people and their needs was really uh, useful for us. And to also understand that there are shared design solutions rather than maybe one design for every single person. There's so, there's so much overlap. And there's also so many people that inhabit multiple identities at the same time, right? So it's, we're not segmented into these different bubbles. So I think that was really eye-opening for us to think about this. But um, it also brings up the conflicts in that it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all kind of kumbaya moment where one perfect restroom can solve everyone's needs. And we've been kind of cataloging all these conflicts of where one person's needs infringe on another. And I think that's really productive territory too. Both Lori and uh, Chalina, the, this uh, intersectional approach also is apparent in how you conduct your research. Can you tell us more about the ways it's informed your work? Sure. I, I think, you know, we say something at KDI often, which is that we work to build a more just public realm, where just for us means complete, inclusive, and resilient. and and. As just as you've said, trying to divine then each of those things, what does complete mean, what does inclusive mean? You know, we started in the most in the most basic way. Well, complete means having all the amenities that are needed. Inclusive means including everyone. Um, with and with within those really simple definitions, we then have always um, pushed ourselves to try to get more specific. And what you've said, I couldn't have said better. It's the more that you push yourself to truly meet that simple definition of including everyone, the more you see where the overlap is, where the conflicts are, where the challenges are. And I think what's been important in our work is to stay committed to confronting those moments of tension even as we think we've maybe finally, you know, finished that list, to not be afraid to see, no, actually we've still missed one intersection that we haven't quite understood right. And 
And the more that we push ourselves to make sure that that list is as nuanced and as complete as it can be, it, the more we have to rework other aspects of our work, how we conduct workshops, um, how we conduct public processes, how we engage people in uh, design feedback, and, and how we go through construction processes and programming of our spaces overall. So uh, there's a ripple effect that happens when you really uh, push yourself to stay at uh, the forefront of understanding the complexity of intersectionality. I think for my work and the work I've been involved with collaborating on, the, on reproductive health care, um, going and meeting with clinic owners and medical staff and escorts and the communities that are both supporting and accessing care really is, is completely intersectional. Um, and you can't, and as I'm sitting there listening and asking questions, it's so apparent that like race, gender, um, economics, all intersect uh, in such critical ways and, and, and in different ways for the different types of people who are coming to access care and provide care. So it's inherent within the issue of reproductive health care access. And I think it because I've had the ability to go and work on the ground, it became, it became far more apparent um, in the field than it would have been just as this academic kind of project or research. So I think, and it, it's interesting to think about how all of our different um, areas, we do participatory engagement. So it's really fueled by speaking to um, those who are going to be using it or overseeing or, or sponsoring the projects. And that also is, is intersectional. So I, for me, it's inherent within the, the, the problem um, itself. Thank you all. Um, so, Lori, you gave a really great example of creative confrontation. In fact, um, uh, we had this wonderful conversation I uh, took took Lori through through the exhibition and I talked about my how I was naive that I thought if I was going to assert about uh, this idea about designing peace that um, we would move in that direction that was my aim to, to shift the conversation away from conflict but in fact it was the opposite in fact conflict uh, appeared <laughs> in a multitude of different ways and you've all touched on that uh, today um, so so you, you spoke about this. Um, how, how do we flip that? Um, it, within the exhibition, I showed all kinds of examples of uh, people protesting um, kind of on the other side. <laughs> but in fact, there's, what you're working on now is um, kind of creating safe, um, healthy environments for uh, people to uh, access this, um, these spaces. Um, are there ways that, um, and I think it's, um, it's, it's, are there ways that we can um, come together with shared space creatively that, um, create something that's uh, this idea of this alternative future that Seb talked about. Um, you voiced it, Seb. Um, what are the ways that, that we're not just on another panel talking about this? Um, how can we, what are the next steps? Um, I think we all want this, but um, I think a lot of us are experiencing how um, uh, it's almost, uh, it's daunting. It just seems almost impossible. Uh, can, can you touch on that or any, any of the three of you? I mean, I, 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 I get that this when I bring people through, but it'd be great to hear from the three of you. What your, your thoughts on that? Um, I'm hopeful uh, and I completely appreciate very much what you mentioned because I too, um, I would say I'm enraged 
and, and frustrated and that we have to keep having these same conversations and serving in similar ways. But I, I have to remain hopeful and there's something I read by Angela Davis a few years ago where she talked about how in a similar vein, like how do you keep doing this work? And she said, well, it's not about it affecting my life, but it's about affecting the generations that come after me. And if I'm not continuing to do it, then, then I'm culpable too. And I think I'm trying to have the longer view, although it's really hard to not be thinking always about the immediate present and how do we respond to that. But I have to remain hopeful that in the longer term, there, there is this escalation of more people being invested and caring. And my students, the students that I engage with and the ones, like they're incredibly invested in issues of social justice and they care immensely about how what they're going to do when they graduate can make a difference in the world. And that gives me immense hope. And I think that is something I have to keep holding on to and helps continue to fuel the work I do in knowing that both in the classroom but also out in the world that there are more people aligned to do this work and hoping that when these projects do get built or that more people are able to see them, that it will help at least shift, shift consciousness and shift conversation, which is the first place for, for change to happen. Yeah, it's interesting because in the uh, one of the things that uh, kind of emerged was this idea of prefigurative intervention, um, and what I mean by that, uh, and that that was apparent um, was, uh, in a lot of the projects that uh, I selected for for the exhibition, including Stalled, um, where we're modeling the future uh, we want to see. Um, today in response to uh, injustices, in, in uh, inequities and inequalities. Um, and so, so uh, I mean, the, I, was, I was very hopeful. I mean, I, I didn't look for these, but it became apparent. And, uh, and it's true for artists, designers, uh, activists um, around the world uh, in, in multitude of different forms and in different scales. Um, um, yeah, I guess one thing that this makes me think of is the kind of like curse of designers being so tempted to fall into solutionism. And I think that's a massive problem that I've observed over the past few years. And I think some ways that we try to like alleviate this curse is looking to other disciplines for help. Like I think working with historians or public health researchers or activists like brings in like a really refreshing perspective to architecture and design that I think like is really productive for us. Um, and then I think for myself personally, like the way that I can kind of keep inspiration and not lose sight of the future and think of generations forward is also do grassroots organizing work outside of the discipline of architecture, which I feel like sometimes I start losing my mind in the ivory tower of like these elite conversations and spaces and institutions and power. So I think working on grassroots scales like brings me a lot of energy. Um, and I think in general, it's difficult when things are so prescient, like in with these news controversies and things of, um, you know, for example, for restrooms, you know, these take years to uh, manifest and fundraise and plan around, but then there's also the very real, just material conditions of like trans and non-binary people's safety today. And how are you showing up for those people in your lives? You know, how are you, whether you believe in, you know, legislative power or mutual aid or like other ways, you know, how are you making sure people are getting fed or getting their medicine or like their health care? So I think like it's always about like, for me, looking outside of architecture and doing those things in parallel. It's interesting that you bring up legislation, uh, and even in your talk you did, and, and Lori, um, in, uh, in your work. Um, and in so, what you wrote about in Contested Spaces, you talked about um, these spatial conflicts, uh, these spatial complexities that are caused by legislation, um, especially in where there's access to safe reproductive health is limited. Um, can you tell us more how um, 
designers, architects, or even everyday citizens can counter these power dynamics. I mean, it really is about um, power, isn't it? Very much so. And I think one of the things I discovered when looking at the building code changes was that most often the people making these decisions had no expertise in the built environment, that they were politicians, they're bureaucrats, and it was a wide, it was a wake up that we who have design expertise have to be more engaged at the policy and the local level so that we can intervene and provide expertise that doesn't exist there and hopefully counter and create better better solutions to move forward. So I think it, it became really apparent that um, we are absent in so many of these spaces of power and, and legislative and decision-making bodies, and that has to stop. And so I think for, you know, and, and, and everyday citizens too, to become aware of who, who are making these decisions and what can you do as a voter or as a citizen and a participant to engage and to speak out and to work um, to, to not or try to help make that not happen. So I think it's about becoming more aware at the local level um, and how it affects your everyday or your, or your community's everyday lives. I also think designers have a bit of a superpower in that regard that, they, uh, that we don't often know that we have or use. Um, but it's become a regular part of our practice to use really simple visualizations or prototypes or kind of quick builds. Um, and I can think of three wildly different projects, one about street vending and, and street vendor regulations, another about uh, vacant lots and city-owned property, and on and on, where in one case, a simple visual diagram, one that someone might do in their first year of design school, um, really changed policy first at the county level and then at the state level. And in another case where a simple prototype, paint, wood, some hammer and nails, uh, changed a, a, a really important city motion about that made it possible for everyday residents to access city-owned vacant lots that would otherwise sit idle collecting trash. So I agree with you. We're absent in places where not only should we be present, but we have a unique capacity to power change. I am being told by uh, those in the audience that uh, we're about to turn to uh, you in front of me and also people online. Um, so it's been really illuminating and inspiring uh, discussion, uh, but I want to uh, ask those in the audience uh, if you could raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. Um, and those tuning in uh, to our live stream, can you share your questions in the chat um, box and we'll read it aloud on your behalf. So who might have, we have a question right here, right up front. Wait for the microphone because the people online can't hear you without the mic. Thank you. Uh, and if you could say your name yeah. and uh, possibly where you, what, who you represent or where you're from or something identifiable like that. Um, yeah. Hi, yeah, my name is Shoka and I, well, I guess I'm new to the city. I'm originally from India, but uh, I work here now in New York, and I think that the work you guys are doing is extremely important, and living in New York, it's hard to think about these kinds of public places without thinking about homeless people, and uh, I guess my question is uh, if you have any ideas for how to make those places that you spoke about, whether it's like public restrooms or healthcare or public transit, more welcoming for homeless people who often have a hard time using especially restrooms and have to like resort to like unfortunately like going outside like on the street or like in park bathrooms which are not necessarily the most hygienic. So yeah, interested to hear th your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, there's so much to say there, but, but I think I'll say this first. It always comes back to a really simple, simple definition for us, which is 
this idea of a just public realm. And there I focus on the word public. Public, by definition, again, means everyone, regardless of any difference you can name, including your housing status. And so in our work, we try to start from that basic principle, a public space, a public restroom, a public right of way. These are all places where unhoused folks have just as much of a right, not just to be in the space, but to also be accommodated and welcomed and served by the space. How you do that, it's, there are, you know, that would be a much longer conversation, but I would say that it, uh, designers, in our firm, of course, but in probably in all of these practices and in many other practices are trying um, to help work on that problem. But, but importantly to something you said earlier, you can't design your way out of this, of these situations because design is, when, when it's getting to a design solution, it's because we haven't worked on the bigger issues that are at the policy and at the structural uh, issues of structural racism and legacies that we need to undo in a much bigger way. That said, um, there's a role for us to play, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shoka, um, for that great question. Yeah, um, I also recommend you check out um, some work that Urban Design Forum has been doing in the Streets for Care series. There have been a series of talks around yeah, design professionals working with city agencies around the treatment of unhoused people in New York City, including restrooms and plazas and all this. So there's a lot of rich content out there. Um, I'll say for restrooms, what always comes up is, you know, what if you know an unhoused person goes in there and locks himself in there and then we have to get them out? Um, or they're doing drugs in there, or other illicit behavior. And I think, I think I agree with Chalina and the limitations in terms of, we can anticipate the ways that design is used, but the maintenance of design and the policing of design is oftentimes outside of our boundary. And we can stimulate those conversations to think about how the design elements will interact with their use, but sometimes it's also like out of our hands. So I want to avoid the kind of trap of being like, we can solve this problem through like a really intelligent, sophisticated design. That being said, there are definitely design elements that come up for me. You know, the most common probably being hostile architecture as it's known, you know, these spikes on benches or other places to keep people from sitting or sleeping. But that actually came up for me in Lori's presentation in your, uh, the sprinkler system that you had done, which is I think really clever and provocative and also kind of polemic where at once it's deterring protesters and obviously there's histories of using water against protesters in very different ways but then on the other side you know kind of propagating this bloom of like flowers or a garden so I think there's like this I think it's a great challenge to be like what is the opposite of hostile architecture or is there counter violence that like architects should be considering here um, so yeah not, not an answer but just an idea that came up yeah Other questions? Hello, thank you for this interesting conversation. My name is Jackie. I'm French and Mexican, and I work in, in New York in one international nonprofit uh, about uh, poverty and social justice, and your urban planner. Uh, and I want to, to ask to you, so, uh, how to bring this um, uh, notion of gender to other latitudes? Because I say, for example, Shanina, you work in in, uh, uh, in Argentina, and sometimes here in, in the United States, New York, it's a very progressive uh, city, but this is not the case around. So when we talk about gender, we also talk about the, the space where gender is difficult to be a set for people. So, and we have uh, diff um, many battles, because we have the battle to find a space to uh, urban and designers and architects to have a place to do participatory process and also to have this gender uh, concept. So how do you think it's the best way to, to bring gender in the discussions and in participatory process uh, with people who sometimes is not open to this kind of discussion? And also, uh, Laurie, you talk about the, you need to, to have the place we, in, in, the, in the political process to have more voice in, in the process. So what do you think is the best way for urban planners, architects, and uh, all, the, all the professionals like us to have the, to raise the voice, to advocate for ourselves and also the people we represent. Thank you. 
You need to have a copy of your handbook to class, yeah. <laughs> On page four, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'll, I'll help me if I forget the second part of, of the question, because I want to get back to that too. But starting with the first part, this was the, a real challenge for us when we started, well, our work started in Kenya and in uh, communities with very uh, traditional gender roles. And we were doing work of gender equitable and inclusive planning at that time in the early stages of our work, but, but we weren't calling it that because we really didn't even know to call it that. Um, and so that really helped us when we went to Argentina and we were specifically commissioned and asked to kind of do what we had been doing in Kenya, but now it had a label on it. It was about creating a gender inclusive process and a gender inclusive design for a plaza in this case. So we sort of reverse engineered it and we said, well, how have we been, I guess, getting away with this work and getting buy-in for this work for all these years in Kenya, which has a very um, traditional, in, in particular communities where we were working, very traditional gender norms. And, and how can we kind of take that template and use it to our advantage in Argentina. And I guess uh, it's not a, a very a novel or, or special formula, but I think it is about looking for intersections. There's so much of, of what makes a place more gender inclusive that really just makes a place work better for everyone. And by honing in on those places of intersection and using those as the kind of uh, key markers of the project or the key goals or outcomes for the project, it actually isn't that hard to get people to buy into those bigger notions. So sometimes it's just about labels and how you talk about things. What we tried to do in the handbook where we couldn't give such a an abstract answer was we tried to build a, a case using data, using case studies, using kind of like a chapter that someone like you who wanted to convince someone who you thought would be hard to move and convince of the topic could go to and kind of see which of those pieces of the case might be useful to you. And so if you look there, you'll see lots of facts and figures and great anecdotes of what you get by thinking about, from, getting, from thinking about our built environment in a more gender inclusive way. And I did forget the second part of the question. Could you just repeat it? Lori's comment. Thank you for your answers here and your response. And yes, that's how the, we can be advocate or to, to have a, a, a best role in, in, the, in this political process to have more, more participation in, in, in the political process where uh, uh, urban planners and architects sometimes are forget because it's something bureaucratic or political uh, to take the decisions. Sure, and I think probably any of us could weigh in on that. So if someone else would like to take that, please do. Actually, Lori wrote a great um, piece in Fast Company. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it, got, it intersects a bit with the first question. And one thing it made, I immediately thought about was, were the UN gender mainstreaming goals that they have for development, which you, you probably have heard of um, as a nonprofit or NGO, and the ways in which um, to think about how the greater good, the greater public will benefit from as inclusive of environments as possible, I think is something that I see and I'm aware of in other countries and not as much in the United States, which I've been thinking something about for a few years and it, it, it's illuminating to think about how um, through policy, uh, through analysis and policy and implementation, that gender mainstreaming has become just accepted form of uh, design, development, planning in other parts of the world. And, and in terms of how do, I think the question was how do we get more uh, people in the design realm fields to be involved? And I've been thinking about that in terms of how 
we educate those uh, moving who will be our future designers, architects, and planners. And they have to, be, we need to teach them about the roles we can play, I think is one way. I think then also creating ways to organize, whether it's through organizations like the AIA or other professional organizations that could have more of a kind of political, have more political power to work within the kind of political systems. But I think a big part of this is about education and outreach and just raising awareness of how we do need to be more involved. Because I don't think kind of as these disciplines were necessarily thinking in those ways. Yeah, another another quick way is, um, and the Architectural League of New York just had a series about this, is like the withholding of architectural labor as a way to get people's attention. You know, if you refuse and start stop complying with certain patterns, I think that's a quick way to get people's attention sometimes to get a seat at the table. So uh, I, I believe it is, it's 7.35, we're a little over. That brings us to the end of the program today. Thank you all uh, again for this important conversation and thank you all for joining us tonight, uh, both in person and virtually. And as a reminder, Designing Peace is on view through August 6th and we welcome you to come visit uh, the museum again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>